Hello and welcome to the Volleycast. I am Joe Trinzi and we got Isaac Newbel again back on the Volleycast. How are you doing, Isaac? Very good. Happy to be back. Good. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday, so it'll be airing on uh, Friday the 24th. A couple of our premium webinars coming up. Got Nate Go from USA Men's National Team. We're talking uh, data analytics and volleyball, and especially just visualizing um, visualizing the data and all that. So we're talking about kind of like staff to staff and staff to player communication, just how to take information and make it usable and actionable, which is kind of one of the challenges nowadays. So you only have one day to sign up for that if you're listening to this, so you're probably going to miss out on that. But next weekend, we got Ben Josephson from Trinity Western. He's Trinity Western men's coach up in Canada, which is, you know, arguably the strongest program in, in North America, you know, really, really good college program up there. And I also got to know him well because he's been an assistant with the uh, Canadian women's national team. So uh, that's going to be on Sunday, May 3rd, and we're specifically talking about how elements of the men's game transfer, can transfer to the women's game. So we're looking at jump serving, some of the stuff that he's doing with jump serving um, and, and also back row attacking and what elements of that um, translate to the women's game as well, what elements don't, what coaches need to know about that kind of stuff. So it's going to be kind of a brainstorming uh, session for that. Uh, Ben's an awesome guy and good coach. So anybody who's interested in, uh, getting on a dialogue with him. Remember, we keep these uh, webinars pretty pretty small, so they can be more of a dialogue and a conversation and a workshop rather uh, than just a seminar. And I know with everything that's going on right now, I'm just seeing all this, uh, you know, hashtag save our sport kind of thing. Play, programs are worried about uh, budgets getting cut and all that. Uh, don't you know if you if you rely on your program for continuing education uh, dollars and all that. Uh, you know, don't let that be an issue. Just send me an email, reach out to me. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're fired up about dialoguing with Ben, I'll make sure you get on the webinar and in the fall or the spring or whatever, when budgets get back up, uh, we can work that stuff out, but rather have you, you get on the webinar now and, and uh, get to that. So that said, uh, Isaac sent you some clips that we were talking about. Uh, we were talking to Dan Fisher this past weekend about specifically like attacking aggressiveness getting attackers to have uh, more of that just aggressive uh, mindset, which of course it can't just be the mindset. You've got to have the technical pieces to it too. And uh, one of the things that kind of got brought up was the double arm lift when they're attacking and you are uh, just somebody who studied the biomechanics of everything in volleyball, but especially the biomechanics of hitting and attacking. Um, and you got some thoughts on what hitters need to do in terms of their biomechanics um, on, and especially on this double arm lift. And uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the, the, the double arm lift, um, and, and uh, if we go one step back, the penultimate step or the step close, however you want to call it, that's kind of like our stride leg, like what a pitcher would do. And so that's what's creating the majority of our force. So like in a pitch, that's 50% of their velocity. And so for us as volleyball players, that step close is going to generate a huge amount of force. We kind of talked about last time is when you generate that force, now you have that ball of energy that you can then utilize for your arm swing. Um, some of the important keys are obviously being able to flex your trunk forward, which is going to allow your arms to go higher during hyperextension. Um, and both of those actions are going to, uh, increase the compressive forces downward as you're going into back extension and then also arm extension. So the, the range of that step close where you gather that energy, a lot of it relies on how well you can actually get your torso down and also explode your arms back into hyperextension. <clears throat> um, now, once you've generated that energy and kind of what we had we had talked about um before the podcast is where now do your arms go and when do people cock the arm back and so what what coaches usually need to understand is that there's going to be a ton of individual variation there just like in pitching mechanics there's a ton of variation yes there are 
like major principles that you we all need to follow but everyone's going to pull at a different point they might pull later they might pull earlier they might lag the arm a little longer um now if we're talking about like a, a perfect swing the perfect scenario then we would talk about the arms going into flexion as high as possible and then the hitting arm drawing back down to basically even with the shoulder line. Um, and now some of the things that are gonna affect that, obviously number one, is gonna be athleticism, right? Now, the one of the most important keys if you're actually wanting to have time, right? Time is really the differentiator. So if you're very, very fast with your double arm lift, that will give you the necessary time you need to actually get the arms up higher and then to also draw back. But that's gonna be affected by many things. The speed of the set, how fast you are off of the ground. And so there's a lot of factors that, that can kind of play into that. So there is gonna be some individual variability. And what coaches are trying to navigate, players and with their coaches helping them are trying to just navigate kind of this question and you hit on it a little bit is basically as I'm bringing my arms up to jump, how early do I pull them? And I think that most coaches, well, I don't say most coaches, but I definitely hear a pretty common view as, as my two arms, they, they, they go back together, they come up together. And when they're about parallel to the ground, that's when my right arm uh, starts to pull back. Would you say that's in the ballpark? Is that kind of like a, a pretty good guidepost for most players or would you I think I think that's a great yeah no I think that's a, a great place for just in general where you should be yeah. is pulling at parallel now what do you see because you you're kind of like a I don't know like a swing mechanics like troubleshooter doc you know you you see you work with club kids you've worked with some professional players mm -hmm. um now when you see players that need to make a change, do you see it because they tend to bring their arms up too high and separate too late? Or do you see a more common mistake being they separate too early? Or do you see both? I see all. I've yeah. seen everything that you could possibly see. Um, one of the, really the, the, the most important principle is how fast you are in your double arm lift. And that goes back to muscle physiology. So I can see if someone jumps and spikes, I can tell immediately whether or not they are utilizing a stretch reflex or not. I can see right away whether they are shoulder driven or they're initiating a stretch reflex up in their internal rotators. And that will tell me usually how they will draw. And so what usually happens is if a, if a person doesn't understand that stretch reflex, if they're not exploding the arms back as the torso is coming down, which is a very important counter motion, then the arms will not have enough speed into flexion. And that is the biggest differentiator that you see, because if they have enough speed, most likely, they will pull at either parallel or right above parallel. But the people that don't utilize the stretch reflex, you'll see them kind of kind of push from their shoulders. Yeah. That decreases the amount of time that they have because they're slower. And usually those players tend to pull way too early. And so they have no momentum from the arms. Remember, our arms are like levers. The longer they are, the more force they're going to carry. The moment they go to a, a double arm lift that's 90 degrees in the elbows, they lose all of that because they don't understand the natural automatic propulsion of that stretch reflex. Yeah, so that sort of like chicken wing mechanic is, exactly. is, a, big, is a big mistake. Um, and, you know, as I'm just kind of walking through that double arm lift, Kind of chicken wing, chicken winging back, like bending the elbows as they go back, yeah. and and or bending the elbows as they come up. Both are pretty much equal mistakes, and that robs a lot of your power because you want that longer lever 
to yeah. be raising your center of gravity as your back. Like that needs to be synced up with the back extension. Yeah, and 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 to piggyback on that, the moment that you you lessen your levers, you decrease the amount of compressive forces downward, right? So equal equal and opposite forces. What we're trying to do is basically we want to treat ourselves as a human spring. And so the, the faster and further you can load the spring, the more energy you're going to produce. So the people that don't use fully extended limbs, they don't understand or utilize the stretch reflex, they have less compressive forces. And again, what they think as fast is actually slower than a stretch reflex because in a stretch reflex, that the reflex is there for a reason. It's to protect our joints from basically tearing off. And so the, the immediate contractile forces of those muscles are gonna be a lot faster and they're automatic. And so that, that, that timing aspect, that speed aspect is really what's the differentiator between pulling correctly, right? Or, or near parallel or above parallel. Or, or pulling much, much um, earlier. Do you, do you give a cue to players about then more about throwing their arms back than lifting them up? Or is there an equal cue? You know what I'm saying? Like, because you want to rely on that stretch reflex coming up. And if that's more involuntary, then is the bigger cue when they're doing their double arm lift about how and when they throw their arms back? Well, it, you know, it's interesting because it's more a question of how – of of their understanding of the body. So most, most people and even coaches, they don't, they have no idea of the, the, the muscle physiology behind it. And so what happens when somebody is, is, is basically pushing from the arms, they have no idea that that is, is actually technically deficient. Right. And so when I see that, the first thing you, you usually have to do is you have to explain, some of these principles, you're not going to go into huge detail, but basically you're, you're having to explain, Hey, you know, our muscles actually load. They actually stretch kind of like rubber bands. And if you know what a rubber band is, when you stretch it and you let it go, it will return automatically. And usually it's that cue that they're like, Oh man, should I didn't even know that muscles work that way at all. And so sometimes it's that cue and also one of the most important is just relaxing, right? Most people, when they're thinking of either hitting or throwing an object forcefully, what do we tend to do? We tend to tense up, right? Because we think that contracting our muscles as hard as we can is going to give us the most velocity, but it has the opposite effect, right? No elasticity, no stretch reflex, and then a loss of power and momentum. So yeah. it's that it's that key of hey, you have to be loose and relaxed. Yeah, yeah. In boxing, they say there when you start pushing your punches, you know, as opposed as opposed to just letting them snap out there. That's like a big a big cue for for boxing and martial arts as well. Something I, I've competed in just a little bit. But uh, so yeah. so that relaxation yeah. key is big, and you know, it's kind of what's interesting as you're talking about the bent arms. There, there is this trade-off that I think a lot of players are trying to navigate, as you're saying, the faster the set is coming across your body, players want to get their arm back early, even if it means that they're losing lift on their jump. Do you think that there is an inherent compromise there? Um, meaning like, if I just, if I throw my arms back and I just swing them up all the way straight up, I'm going to get maybe my highest possible jump, but then my arm might be loaded later. You know what yeah. I'm saying? My arm comes up way past parallel. I mean, theoretically, once my toes have come off the ground, my arms can't do anything else, but my arms are coming up way past parallel. That's a higher jump, but then it's a slower cock back to load. And I think that some hitters, like, especially like I see sometimes like middle hitters, like they're really loaded really early, especially middle hitters who aren't huge jumpers. <laughs> but then they wind up losing more on their jump. Do you see that as some degree of a trade-off? Like if you load your arm a little earlier, you're going to lose a little bit on your jump, but you might need to. There, there is a trade-off. It's faulty mechanics. Um, yeah. there's, a, it's, there's a trade-off, but it's nominal. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very small. And so 
if you're going to gain whatever an inch on your jump you know you could you, you could argue either way but for like a middle usually most middles that <clears throat> tend to lift tire with their arms are much earlier right and that's usually how you train middles is you want them up really really early it's the ones that are late that do not have time now to actually get full lift and so what do they have to do they have to pull really early to set the arm up so again it's that that it's that timing piece that's really the key but yes there will be a slight trade-off but one that i don't think is extremely important unless it's really really bad so that so again if you decide to flex even past parallel you will now have less time to load right to cock back the arm and to separate your hip and your shoulder which is one of the biggest predictors of arm velocity out there right because you're loading your core muscles and so it's really the trade off of height versus arm velocity and with most high level volleyball players most of them pull pretty early and they're really trying to lag the arm as much as they can and the best ones have huge amounts of hip and shoulder separation because the further you get the more eccentric loading you get in those those core muscles and then you can activate much much harder so that's kind of the trade-off. Yeah, so it can be a little bit of like a snowball effect when hitters are late. They want to pull their arm early. They want to get their arm loaded earlier because they're trying to catch up to the ball. Yes. So they end up introducing this technical flaw because they, when it's a timing issue, they, they weren't planting in their step close early enough, so they didn't have time for all this to happen. So then they have to kind of, and then they wind up kind of punching at the ball. And, and I see this a lot with hitters that are trying, you know, to, and to be honest, I see it a little bit more in the women's game. Um, but hitters that are trying, especially outside hitters who are trying to hit a fast tempo set, big emphasis on hitting faster tempo sets, especially in more situations. And uh, hitters want to be on time because setters want to push the pace. And then when they're late, then they want to just kind of come up with this chicken wing and kind of get here early and then you then they're kind of punching from the side instead of letting all that go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah, and and the the interesting part, right, is is you said you see it mostly on the women's side. Why do you think that is? Well, unfortunately, throughout history, right, girls have not been in throwing sports, right? So what ends up happening is all of these really important motor learning things that happen at adolescence, right, to actually learn the overhead throwing motion, which the volleyball swing is, they don't end up, they don't even end up um, learning how to do it. And so what ends up happening a lot of the time is their body tries to do whatever it can to get force out of the arm. And one of the more common things that you see on the women's side is there's no horizontal abduction or draw of the arm it actually just goes right over their head. So yep. basically they're going right into external rotation, which may give them a little more height, but you will lose a lot of velocity because you're never preloading your core muscles. You're never eccentrically loading the core muscles. Yeah, that's sort of like almost the other side of the coin. And, I, and you know what, I see that a lot with high school kids. Mm -hmm. And they have like no, no pop, like they come all the way straight up over their head. Yeah. And then there's, there's, there's no pop to it. And sometimes I wonder with, with, you know, kids kind of coming up and I, I wonder if a little bit of that is like, they're worried about missing the ball. Like when you want, when you train, you know, like youth kids, like, you know, kids who are 13, mm -hmm. their setters are so inaccurate. It's almost like they want to get their hand they're afraid to get their hand away from the ball and yeah. like unload through it. Unload. And it's almost like they just keep their hand up close to the ball, even if they're just padding at it. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's just a, a little bit too much of an assumption, but like you said, one of the hallmarks of the, uh, of, you know, high level players is, 
is this separation where they're, they're pulling actually their hand away from the ball to then unload it. I think like a lot of kids, they kind of have trouble with that mentality. So you have like the two sides of the coin, either you pull it way too high and then you can't, you got no load. You're just padding up the ball. And then when I think that what I see a little bit of a trend is players who load too early, they got more, you know, even if it's not a great load, if it's, if it's early, they got more heat than the kid who has no load, but then it's this kind of faulty mechanic, a little bit of a windmill mechanic that can kind of get reinforced over time. And then when a player kind of gets used to hitting like that, their timing is ingrained in there. And I think that can be tough for a lot of coaches to break. It can, and it can't be. So, so when, when a coach doesn't have an, an idea or is not, <laughs> I, I love how your answer to all these like common things is like, well, it's not really that hard if you know what you're doing, <laughs> which, which well, is awesome. That's why I love to hear you. Know, yeah. In, 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 a in lot my, of coaches struggle with. Yeah. Because in my experience, most people don't have any idea about these things. And these are like really critical muscle physiology and biomechanic things that, I mean, if you are, if you want to be good at what you do, you should, you should have at least a base, a base knowledge of these things. You don't have to know how much, as much as I do. That's not the point. But if you know just some small principles, you can, you can help out your athletes so much more because at the end of the day, you are providing at the very base level, you're providing an experience for a human being. And so why not make their experience, no matter what their athletic ability is, but you're going to give them every tool that they can to maximize themselves, no matter their, their athletic potential, right? But that's usually where the rub is, is that when you don't have an idea about this stuff, you're just, you're just going off of opinion. And so like a lot of coaches that might see a windmill swing, right? They're like, oh, that, that's wrong. They, they, they can't time a volleyball. Guess what? You know, one of the biggest swings in volleyball history is Clay Stanley, mm -hmm. right? What does he do? That would be considered a windmill swing. Yep. And he has an absolute cannon. Yeah. Right. Flo Hyman on the women's side, one of the all-time greats too. Pretty, yes. pretty, pretty well. So, so anybody watching this can get a little bit more of an idea. You had a couple of video clips that are you oh, able yeah. to pull a couple of these up? Yeah, why don't you share yeah. your screen so anybody who's watching on the YouTubes can check it out. Anybody who's just listening to the podcast, you can go over uh, to the YouTube channel, put that in the show notes, and check some of these out. Cool. Is this up? Yep. Okay. Let me let's go back to the beginning. Um, so I, 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 I forget this woman's name. She's amazing. She's one of the best outsides from Serbia. Um, and this so going to be Brankica Mihailovic. Number nice. Thank you. Thank you. So she, right. If you take a look at when she pulls is right at about parallel, right. And she pulls heavily. Right? Mm -hmm. You see how low the forearm goes. Right, that's pulling basically by her chest. I mean, that's pretty low, you know. But when I see that, I'm like, she's going to absolutely crush this thing, because what she's doing is she's maximizing her body's ability yeah. to gain power. The reason that athletes will lag their forearm, like Clay or or like 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 her in this example, is because the longer they lag it, right? It's like a baseball pitcher that that lags the arm the more momentum they will have as that arm goes into external rotation right here. The further and faster that goes back into external rotation, you get a what? A stronger stretch reflex. Okay, exactly. So all of, and she gets bounce blocked in this example, but yeah. it's a very good example to see how far, look at where her elbow is in this example. Yeah. It is past her spine, past her spine. And, and for all of the, maybe, I don't know if there's any younger athletes watching, but all the coaches, look at the positioning of her body right now. Her hips are facing the net. Her torso is open. This right here is one of the biggest predictors of velocity, high level velocity, because now her core muscles are pre-stretched. That's why she can explode or rotate her core faster than a normal athlete would. 
And that's why she can get very, very low in external rotation, which at the end of the day is going to give you a ton of velocity, right? Can you go back to her toe off, like mm -hmm. her kind of toe coming off the ground? So she's bringing her double arm lift up to parallel. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's she's pulling it back from a low point. She's coming kind of through to that parallel, and then she's coming down a little bit into the pull. So yes. I think that's what a lot of hitters miss. Like they want to get into that low pulled position. Mm -hmm. So they cut their double arm lifts off early and yeah. kind of just come back rather than still coming up and then pulling down. Yeah. And usually in my experience, that's been a slow double arm lift. That's yeah, a result okay. of a very slow double arm lift because okay. they don't. And, and guess what? If they don't understand the stretch reflex in the double arm lift, most likely they won't understand the double arm lift in the arm swing and they will do what? A voluntary or conscious forcing of the arm forward. That's usually a telltale sign right there. The way they jump is usually the way that they're going to swing. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay. And she's got a huge that, back swing. So she's got a yeah. huge back swing. So that's given her that, the power on the double arm lift. Yes. Well, well, right now, right in this position here, all of her shoulder flexors are stretching, right? They're, they're, those rubber bands are loading. And they're going to get to a point where they say, we can't go anymore. And guess what happens? Boom, they fire. And that's going to explode those arms out. Yeah. And that back leg push is actually very, very important and critical to closing the hips. That's one of the biggest mistakes players make, especially young ones. They don't understand that they're supposed to jump rotationally, not just vertically. Mm -hmm. So, and that's yeah. why most people, most outside hitters, right-handed outsides land on one leg, left leg, yeah. because there is not enough rotational uh, motion in their hips. So now, uh, I'm sure you see, let me move this cursor here. I'm sure most people have seen this big time swing. And look where he's step closing from. <laughs> so he's taken off from about eight feet, right? But extremely fast, one of the, probably one of the best volleyball players to ever play the game, mm -hmm. right? And, we'll, and we're going to see in the next example where his elbow is. But he absolutely kabooms this thing. And so going back to the, the replay, take a look at where he actually pulls. Look at how low he drops. Look at that. Yep. Huge, huge leg. So what, what do you think that, so right now, this position right here, he's actually stretching his external rotators. So basically what happens is a chain reaction. He stretches the external rotators, which then stretch reflex or, or catapult back. To stretch the internal rotators. Exactly. So it's a huge chain reaction that happens. And then internal rotators stretch and then kaboom, right? One of the biggest swings in that, in that match. And, and again, any, any, a club volleyball coach will look at this and say, oh, no, that's wrong. It's too much of a windmill. Yeah. This is one of the best volleyball players to ever play the game. And he absolutely crushes this thing, right? You know what I'm just – what I'm really seeing as you're breaking some of these details down is that the difference between a windmill that starts from the ground and a windmill that's loaded as you're coming into the air. You know what I mean? Like the, they all have that double arm lift. They yes. all have that – they both – well, all these two – um, Mihailovic and, and Marilla now, um, they have that double arm lift. Yep. But as the toes are coming off the ground, they pull it so fast they can get into that stretch. They're, yep. not, cut, they're not cutting that double arm lift early to get into the windmill. So that's something that I'm noticing as you're showing these two examples. Yeah. But again, these are the, the best athletes in the world, you know. I mean, coaches. Of, I mean, that level of core strength you're talking about, your high school kid is not going to be able to get into those stretch positions because. Now, is it like the way I've always thought about it is almost like chicken and the egg. Like as they get stronger, they'll be able to get into these stretch positions. But by working on the correct mechanics, they're going to build their strength in the specific. And then, and then like that stretch is going to deepen and deepen if they're kind of doing it with the right awareness and the right technique. Like their strength in those positions is going to increase. I mean, strength training is kind of is that's a whole other topic. You know, we, that's a whole other podcast to dive into. 
But do you see it that, that way when they have the right mentality and they're practicing the right technique, they'll build the strength and they'll be able to stretch further? Um, I think it's just learned over time. Now, remember, you could be the strongest person in the world, right? You could lift the most amount of weight. But if you don't know how to do this stuff mechanically, it won't ever matter. Because you and fire so, at the wrong times in the wrong order. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and for most guys, right, we tend to want to push a lot, right? Because yeah. we have this caveman mentality where it's not fluid, right? You, you don't build any elastic energy. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to continue? Uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's see one more. Okay. Uh, so now we got, we got Matt, which you've, you've talked about before. Mm hmm so he pulls a little more above but then again it just crosses his chest like most and this is another another funny thing right so let's take a look so he you can see the hip is closing right sorry this is not the cleanest example but the hips are always rotating first so it's always going to be hip torso arm yeah you can see really clearly there yeah yeah big separation so so you want the the torso perpendicular to the hips. And then if you're doing it right up in the last part of the kinetic chain and the last counter motion, as that torso rotates through forward, the arm should go into external rotation at the exact same time. Yep. And you get that full rotation. And this, um, the last one I wanted to show you was, what is this guy, Nishida, I think? Yeah, yep. yeah, so huge vert, huge athleticism. This is a nice example right here. So he lifts basically above his face and then watch how low he drops it. Lags, right? This is, this is the pitcher taking the ball out of the glove and dropping all the way down right now. Huge separation he gets, big, big separation. So his left glute is activated right now, hips are closed and big, big power. I mean, he's one of the, one of the better young opposites now in the world. Yep. And there you go. Awesome. Yeah, the, I mean, those three examples are, are really clear. And like I said, anybody who's listening to the podcast, uh, you can check out the YouTube and, and I'll, I'll put the YouTube link in the podcast show notes uh, to check those out. Those are uh, really good examples. And I think that one of the things that you really cleared up up there that I think is really helpful for player, for coaches as they're teaching this double arm lift is to see the difference between um, cutting the double arm, like a slow double arm lift that you cut off early to try to kind of push it back into the swing and that really fast double arm lift that then is followed up by that dynamic, like, and can be a low stretch back. So that's, that's, that's really good stuff. I, th I think that's something that coaches and I think any coach watching these can share those clips with their players and have their players start being aware of that stuff. And I don't know, that's something that players can maybe, I mean, not a lot of players can get in the gym and hit right now, but that's, they can rehearse a little bit of that feel for what those stretch positions might feel like and what it might feel like to have the hips go first and, and have a little bit of that separation, that, that internal rotation stretch back. I mean, something is better than nothing. And that's something that players can be doing right now. Totally. Totally. Awesome. So that's, uh, that's time for us, but Isaac, uh, that's awesome stuff. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, check out Isaac's work. He's uh, on Instagram at, at TorqueVB, T-O-R-Q-V-B. Uh, he's got some good stuff. Hit him up on social media. I think he's just, uh, you know, this is really good stuff that not a lot of coaches specialize in. I think as coaches, we want to, we're investing heavily in the tactics of the game and how you plan practice and team systems. But I think that just as coaches in general, we can, we can do better with the biomechanics and understanding like the little nuances of some of this individual stuff. I agree. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks Isaac. And thanks everybody for listening to the podcast.